The Royal Canadian Air Force was established in 1924. In its early history, the RCAF had low enlistment numbers and therefore had difficulty sustaining itself. However, in 1939, the RCAF was given the opportunity to contribute to the war effort on a large scale. On the 26th of September 1939, the British government proposed the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan to the Canadian government. The participation in this plan would eventually be considered Canada's greatest contribution to the Second World War. The plan's goal was to train air crew away from active warfare and to produce an endless stream of airmen to replace those currently serving overseas. The British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, which transformed Canada's role in the war in terms of the preparation of air crew, not only pilot, but air crew. But in addition, Canada supplied 25% of all the crew for RAF Bomber Command. Canada signed the plan on the 17th of December, 1939, along with Australia and New Zealand. Canada was chosen as the central training area due to the fact that it was close to Britain, it had potential to manufacture aircraft, and could use the resources available from the United States. As a central component to, for the plan, Canada was required to shoulder much of the cost, most of which went towards building runways and buildings, such as the initial, elementary, and service flying schools where pilots were trained. Classes officially began on the 29th of April, 1940, often referred to as Zero Day. The positions that Canadian graduates were trained for were as pilots, navigators, air bombers, wireless operators, air gunners, and flight engineers. I think that it's impossible, given the way in which the war evolved, not to have an enormous focus on some of the most dramatic land battles of the war. It's very hard to write air history. So much of it is, is, is in a sense, routine and repetitive. Throughout the war, interest in the air training plan continued to grow. In July of 1941, the RCAF established the Women's Division on the suggestion of the British. This gave women an opportunity to serve outside of the standard woman professions such as nursing. Women were recruited by using the appeal of patriotism, adventure, and the idea that they were supporting male family members who were already serving in the RCAF. I would argue that what women in entering the, the RCAF in the early, early allowed for is allowed a higher proportion of the best available male volunteers. The role women played in the Air Force was initially administrative. Over time, they worked on air ground communication and plotted RCAF and enemy planes both in Canada and overseas. One woman who served was Jean Lee. She was the only Chinese-Canadian woman to serve in the RCAF Women's Division from 1942 to 1945. The inclusion of women led to other minorities being recruited into the RCAF. The RCAF gave families the opportunity to support themselves by making a good salary alongside an allowance for their dependents. The issue was that many racial minorities were barred from enlisting and receiving these benefits. As the war progressed, however, the Canadian military required more men to supply reinforcements to a towering overseas force. Thus, the discrimination against Aboriginal, Chinese, and Black Canadians was overlooked in favor of enlisting the needed amount of manpower. Beginning in 1941, the RCAF gave Native Americans the opportunity to enlist, eventually followed by Asian Canadians in 1942. Overseas, many Chinese Canadians worked in the field offices because new British policies barred the government from denying minorities the right to enlist. Black Canadians were finally allowed to enlist in 1943. However, once the war was ended, there were few gains in terms of social equality for these minorities. After completing training in Canada, most graduates were shipped overseas to complete their commitment to the air training plan. Initially, there were no squadrons specifically assigned to the Commonwealth countries, despite their presence in every squadron. In 1942, the RAF established the Number 6 Group, which was part of Bomber Command and formed completely of Canadian airmen, numbering approximately 5,700. Canada would have contributed such a large element to the Bomber Command that it had to be have an identifiable group in which Canadian officers could be promoted above the level of Wing Commander. This was a fulfillment of Article 15 of the Air Training Plan, which stated that the Dominions would be given their own presence while serving under the RAF. As part of Bomber Command, Canadians were a part of the strategic bombing of Germany. British officers believed this would end the war, 
by halting production in industrial cities and weakening the German morale. Canadian pilots and air crew remain a vital part of RAF squadron throughout the entire war. The Canadian became one of the principal part of the tactical air force, so much so that on D-Day, more than 50% of the planes in the sky above the beaches in Normandy in the Canadian and British sector were from RCAF squadrons. Planes commonly used for these enterprises were the Halifax and Lancaster bombers, which held crews of four to seven members. These flights had great risk and many air crews were downed throughout the course of the war. The air story ought to be much larger in our consciousness than it is. And I guess the reason it isn't is because it was so thoroughly integrated with the RAF. By the end of the war, the RCAF had managed to graduate 131,553 recruits from the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and draw from a wider pool of enlistments to prove itself as a powerful force that had gained an immeasurable amount of maturity.